the year was 1945, and a 23-year-old soldier by the name of Garvin Lamb was in the Allied invasion of Germany, east of the Rhine. His rank was that of a technician fourth grade, which is symbolized with a capital letter T below three chevrons and is the equivalent to that of a sergeant. A technician possessed specialized skills directly related to combat, such as a tank driver or that of a combat engineer. One dark evening, on the front lines of the advance, Garvin was serving as a forward observer. A forward observer would watch the horizon for any flashes that occurred from something like an enemy firing a mortar round or that of a muzzle flash of a rifle, any light or flash at all. He would then record those coordinates and radio that information to a corresponding forward observer. Together, both used geometry to triangulate and pinpoint the position of the flash. That information would then be radioed to the Allied forces so that they could strike that position. This particular evening, Garvin recounts how they were maintaining light discipline, which is to infer total darkness, no flashlights or light sources of any kind. However, a soldier within his unit decided to break that order and light up a cigarette. Within seconds, the enemy had seen the flicker of light from that small flame, triangulated their position, and mortars were raining down upon them. Almost 60 years later, Garvin, through tears streaming down his face, recalls the horrors of those moments, how it happened so fast, and how he lost many friends that night. The only reason I know this story is because Garvin Lamb is my grandfather. In a world of spiritual apathy, this podcast is a call to arms. I am your host, Ryan Maglinger, a broken and marred clay vessel, unfit to be used even as a chamber pot, now commissioned by my Lord for service unto my King, Jesus. Welcome to Season 1 of By His Grace, For His Glory. This is Episode 1, Basic. Christians are to be a light on a hill. Matthew 5, 14-16 says as much, quote, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Christians should know that the enemy is looking for this light within believers. Obviously, this contrast is easily distinguishable by the darkness of this world. This enemy uses the light that we shine in order to triangulate their attack upon those who follow Christ. We need to be aware that the enemy's ultimate goal is to snuff out that light. Jesus, fully cognizant of the battles happening in the spiritual realm, also knew to warn his disciples about this reality, that they were in the midst of a spiritual war, the likes of which we as believers cannot completely ascertain. Why? Because we cannot see the enemy around us. Paul in Ephesians 6.12 described it in this manner, quote, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. End quote. Jesus was aware that the battle raged on, and so he issued his followers this warning, recorded in Matthew 10, verses 16-22, through 22, quote, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be as wary as serpents, and as innocent as doves. But be on guard against people, for they will hand you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before the governors and kings on my account, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who are speaking, but it is the Spirit of your Father who is speaking in you. Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. Truly, Christians are engulfed in a cosmic struggle against an enemy who seeks our destruction. So I'm sure many listening might ask the question, 
Who in their right mind would enlist to serve in such a war? A war in which wages a battle against a very powerful and invisible enemy. The answer is that our enlistment was supernatural. Our carnal nature was happy indulging in sin, and our master at the time, the prince of the power of the air, was happy to placate us for a season, to distract us from the real reason by which we were created. Ephesians 2 gives an accurate description of us prior to our enlistment, in that we were, quote, dead in our trespasses and sins. And if you take the time to read the following verses, you find that we were more than content to continue that lifestyle. However, let's take a look at 2 Timothy 2, 3-4, as it speaks of the one whom enlisted us, and it explains that we also have a new desire which motivates us to please our Lord. Quote, Suffer hardship with me, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him. In John MacArthur's commentary on 2 Timothy, he writes the following about this particular passage. Paul not only calls on Timothy to serve the Lord as a soldier, but as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. A spiritual Christian does not simply do minimum duty for his Lord, but serves him with everything he is and has. The first mark of a good soldier that Paul mentions is the willingness to suffer hardship. By adding the text, with me, Paul gives assurance that he would not ask anything of Timothy that he himself was not willing to do. In John MacArthur's book entitled The Truth War, he describes our battle for certainty in an age of deception. This written work is a master class about the very battle the Christian is called to serve and contend for. In it, he describes how the apostles defended the truth with their very lives, and includes an account of two early church leaders by the name of Ignatius and Polycarp. There is nothing heroic about what they do, and nothing noble about what they stand for but they are significant symbols of a deeply troubling trend that plagues this current generation worldwide. It seems there is no shortage of people nowadays willing to kill for a lie, yet few seem to be willing to speak up for the truth, much less die for it. Consider the testimonies of the Christian martyrs throughout history. They were valiant warriors for the truth. They were not terrorists or violent people, of course, but they fought for the truth by proclaiming it in the face of fierce opposition, by living lives that gave testimony to the power and goodness of truth, and by refusing to renounce or forsake the truth, no matter what threats were made against them. The pattern starts in the first generation of church history with the apostles themselves. All of them, with the possible exception of John, died as martyrs. Even John paid a dear price for standing in the truth as he was tortured and exiled for his faith. Truth was something they loved and fought and eventually died for, and they handed that same legacy to the next generation. Ignatius and Polycarp, for example, were early Christian truth warriors. Both were personal friends and disciples of the Apostle John, so they lived and ministered when Christianity was still very new. History records that both of them willingly gave their lives rather than renounce Christ and turn from the truth. Ignatius was personally interrogated by the emperor Trajan, who demanded that he make a public sacrifice to idols to prove his loyalty to Rome. Ignatius could have saved his life by yielding to that pressure. Some might try to excuse such an outward act under pressure as long as he didn't deny Christ in his heart. But the truth was more important to Ignatius than his life. He refused to sacrifice to the idols, and Trajan ordered that he be thrown to wild beasts in the stadium for the amusement of pagan crowds. Ignatius' friend Polycarp, wanted by authorities because he also was known to be a leader among the Christians, gave himself up willingly, knowing full well that it would cost him his life. Brought to a stadium before a bloodthirsty mob, he was ordered to curse Christ. Polycarp refused, saying, Eighty-six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king 
who saved me. He was burned alive on the spot. Listen to Paul Washer talk about the believer and how he must not entangle himself with the things of this world. Strong men grow old and old men die. Yes, yeah, strong men die. Men who are genius die. Strong men grow weak and die. All men die. Have you really grasped that as a man? I don't mean just played around with it and, l and laughed and told a joke about it. Have you sat down and really thought about this? You're going to die. And everything you lived for outside of the will of Christ is going to burn. Everything. You say, well, but I'm not a missionary and I'm not a preacher. If you're in this church, you know better than to use that language. You can be a policeman. And be a policeman every moment of your life for the glory of God and he takes it as service. You can be a doctor. You can be a ditch digger. You can work construction. So don't, don't play that game. It doesn't matter who we are. Missionary in the Congo our construction worker out on the highway. If we know Christ and Christ knows us, there's no longer the division of secular and sacred in our life. Everything is sacred if it's offered to him. And he takes it as service to him. One of the most life-changing things that I experienced, I experienced before I was converted. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that led to my conversion. My father... I was, I was many times afraid of him. He was big. He was strong. He was good. I wanted to be like him in so many ways. We're running with a roll of wire, putting up a fence for the horses. Put a pole between the wire, one man on one side, one on the other, and you roll it out. And all of a sudden, when we were talking, we were talking about upcoming basketball season and and all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, I looked down and then I heard him scream. I felt the wire drop. I grabbed him. We fell to the ground. He was dead. I realized at that moment, it didn't matter if I was like my father, who I never thought I would be like. It doesn't matter. He's dead. He'd be strong like him. And die. Courageous like him. And die. Successful. And die. Intelligent. And die. You fall in love. You lose her. In the end. You need to contemplate. You need to get away from media. And contemplate your own death. And contemplate everything you have invested in. Where are your investments? If we are to invest our lives into the work of the Lord, we must operate as 2 Timothy 2 instructs, by not entangling ourselves with this world. The problem lies therein, in that we have an innate desire to please people. MacArthur's commentary continues with this, Even Christians are tempted to be men-pleasers, Many Christians succumb to that temptation and become more concerned about pleasing their fellow co-workers, their neighbors, their friends, than about pleasing the Lord. And for the same reason, many pastors fall into the trap of wanting to please their congregations or their communities more than to please the Lord. That desire inevitably leads to moral and spiritual decline because pleasing the world, including worldly Christians, demands compromise of God's truth, God's standards, and personal holiness. It demands forsaking Christ as our first love. We must remind ourselves of Paul's sobering testimony in Galatians 1, where Paul writes, If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ.
John Calvin wrote a letter back in June of 1552 to five young men who had graduated from his seminary in Geneva. If you recall, his seminary was commonly referred to as the School of Death, for reason that if you graduated from there, you would most likely be martyred. I have asked author extraordinaire Robert Wayne B. to grace our eardrums by reading a portion of John Calvin's letter to these five former students as they were held in captivity. However, we have not forgotten you, neither I nor all the brethren hereabouts, as to whatever we have been able to do for you. As soon as you were taken, we heard of it and knew how it had come to pass. We took care that help might be sent you with all speed and are now waiting the result. Those who have influence with the prince in whose power God has put your lives are faithfully exerting themselves on your behalf, but we do not yet know how far they have succeeded in their suit. Meanwhile, all the children of God pray for you as they are bound to do, not only on account of the mutual compassion which ought to exist between members of the same body, but because they know well that you labor for them in maintaining the cause of their salvation. Be confident, therefore, that he will not leave the work of his hand imperfect. You know what scripture sets before us to encourage us to fight for the cause of the Son of God. Meditate upon what you have both heard and seen formally on this head, so as to put it in practice. For all that I could say would be of little service to you were it not drawn from this fountain. And truly, we have need of a much more firm support than that of men to make us victorious over such strong enemies as the devil, death, and the world. But the firmness which is in Christ Jesus is sufficient for this, and all else that might shake us were we not established in him, knowing then in whom ye have believed, manifest what authority he deserves to have over you. In conclusion, I beseech our good Lord that he would be pleased to make you feel in every way the worth of his protection of his own, to fill you with his Holy Spirit, who gives you prudence and virtue, and brings you peace, joy, and contentment. And may the name of our Lord Jesus be glorified by you to the edification of his church. From Geneva, this 10th of June, 1552. This is precisely what Christ is saying in Matthew 16, 24, that if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Everyone in Jesus' day would have understood that taking up a cross meant death. Satan sought to extinguish these five young men before they could ever gain traction and make headway on the spiritual battlefield. And God allowed Satan to do so. Believers today are scratching their heads and thinking that by all earthly metrics, we would conclude what a tremendous loss. Lies with great promise and potential unfulfilled. Most often, when tragedy strikes, we question God as to why. How does allowing the enemy to end the life of five young men further the cause of Christ? This kind of question is rooted in a myopic, finite view of humanity and neglects God's omniscient, omnipotent wisdom. Where we see loss, God records gain and is ultimately glorified. You see, 469 years later, we still talk of these men and their testimony. A testimony under their willingness to take up their cross and be a living sacrifice unto the glory of God. The sad reality of our current culture is we are lacking a soldier's mentality and how do we know this? Well, dare I say that most individuals who attend church today wouldn't go to a seminary, let alone a church known within its community as the Church of Death. We see back in the 1500s that didn't deter these five men. They knew precisely what they were signing up for. They understood the cost of taking up one's cross to follow Christ and lived out their faith till the very end. Just imagine for a moment that in your community there was a church known among the people by the same moniker of that of Calvin's school. Its notoriety came about in that community due in part to martyring the believers of that congregation as they go out from a Sunday worship service to proclaim the gospel. How would we imagine weekly attendance would be? Undoubtedly, the American church has been blessed beyond all measure. We have had the freedom together as we have seen fit, 
We have ample access to Bibles, books about the Bible, sermon downloads, Christian radio broadcasts, and so much more. But has that made Christians in this nation into stronger believers, by contrast to that of our brothers and sisters in Christ who serve in hostile nations? I would argue that the church, especially here in America and in the modern era, has not cultivated courage, but rather complacency, which in turn leads to cowardness. Simply put, we are afraid, and sadly the characteristics of the American church are very similar to that of the rich young ruler found in Mark chapter 10. We proudly exclaim, we've kept the commandments, but when called to give up all we have to follow Jesus, we turn away sorrowful because we feel as though we have too much to lose. I would like to play for you an excerpt from Pastor Joey Pearson of Maranatha Bible Church, who is speaking of the type of commitment we are called to emulate even when the toll transcends from the spiritual battlefield into the physical realm. We don't know persecution. Okay, I'm talking today, in 2021, in places in the Middle East and other places, they have to have underground church. Because if they were to get caught having church, they would be killed on the spot. I can, we're live streams, so I'll be careful, but I know of a church not in our country, in a different country where there's a, there's a girl who sings specials and she has no hands. And the reason she has no hands is because she's been caught passing out tracks twice. She passed out a track and authorities caught her and they cut off her hand. That was the punishment for passing out the, that religious stuff. So guess what she did? She did it again. She got caught about a year later. They took her other hand. Now she uses her mouth to give tracts to strangers. Now, if you're kind of doing the math, you understand that three strikes and she's out. And yet, you and I won't do it at Walmart because we're worried they might frown at us. How does a believer find courage to back up their convictions in a day and age where the pressures of this world compel us to remain silent or else? Dr. Vody Bauckham, Jr. is the Dean of Theology at the African Christian University in Lusaka, Zambia. He's a former pastor and also an author of multiple books, his most recent entitled Fault Lines. In a sermon he preached at the National Founders Pre-Conference special event on January 20th, 2021, he addressed the idea of Christian courage for Christ in the public square. How do you threaten a dead man? A man who truly believes for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How do you threaten that man? The answer is you can't. The problem with most of us is we're not dead yet. We haven't died to self. We haven't died to the world. And so we desperately desire and we desperately want and we desperately need to be liked and applauded. And so when they threaten to take our stuff, we say, okay, we'll find a way. We'll find a way to comply. And then, it, and then it slips out and we come back again and they, they threaten to take our freedom and we say, no, 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 please. I promise I'll do better this time. And then, and then again, it slips out and they say, well, take your life. And you say, no, no, please, please don't, please don't. But when we get a hold of the fact that we have been crucified with Christ and yet we live not I, but Christ who lives in me. L listen, when we get a hold of that, it changes everything. John Bunyan, who wrote in Pilgrim's Progress, quote, For some, the entrance to hell is through the portals of heaven, end quote. How many churches will be responsible for leading people into hell, all under the guise of being friendly, so as not to offend anyone? As our culture has declined into a depraved state of madness, we as believers in Christ need to stand fast upon Scripture and Scripture alone, 
and proclaim the saving truth of the gospel. Yes, by being the light in this dark world, we will undoubtedly be attacked. So stand at the ready and take upon yourselves the armor of God. It is God himself who has equipped us and given us precisely what we need to withstand the wiles of the devil. All throughout history, we find followers of Christ who displayed great acts of bravery in the face of evil in order to proclaim the gospel of Christ. It is my belief that conviction drives bravery. Allow me to cite a few of some of my favorite examples of such displays in so much that we might glean encouragement for how we are to live out our faith. In the book, The Unquenchable Flame, on page 138, it records the history of the Oxford Martyrs. It says this, Among Mary's most famous victims were the old Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cramner, the famous preacher and Bishop of Rochester, Hugh Ladmere, and the Bishop of London, Nicholas Ridley. In 1555, Ridley and Ladmere were burned together, back to back, at the end of Broad Street in Oxford. Ladmere, aged about 80, was the first to die, shouting through the flames, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle, by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. Unfortunately for Ridley, the wood had badly been laid around him, so that he suffered terribly, his legs burning off before the rest of him was touched. The horrible sight apparently moved hundreds to tears. Five months later, Thomas Cramner was burned on the same spot. The old archbishop and architect of so much of the English Reformation, now nearly 70, had under extreme duress renounced his Protestantism. It was a triumph for Mary's reign. Despite his recantation, however, he was such an embodiment of the Reformation that it was decided he should be burned in any case. It was a decision that would more than undo Mary's victory. For when the day came, Cranmer refused to read out his recantation. Instead, he stated boldly that he was indeed a Protestant, though a cowardly one for forsaking his principles. In consequence, he announced, For as much as my hand offended, writing contrary to my heart, my hand shall first be punished therefore. He was true to his word. As the fires were lit, he held out his hand that had signed his recantation so that it might burn first. Having briefly denied his Protestantism, Cramner thus burned with moving defiant bravery, and so died the first Protestant Archbishop of Canterbury. Author Eric McTaxis, in his book Bonhoeffer, subtitled Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy, he writes about Dietrich on page 528. So less than 24 hours before he left this world, Bonhoeffer performed the offices of a pastor. In the bright Schoenberg schoolroom that was their cell, he held a small service. He prayed and read the verses for that day, Isaiah 53, 5, With his stripes we are healed, and 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He then explained these verses to everyone. Best recall that Bonhoeffer spoke to us in a manner which reached the hearts of all, finding just the right words to express the spirit of our imprisonment and thoughts and resolutions which it had brought. The other prisoners in the schoolhouse hoped that they might be able to get Bonhoeffer to hold a service for them as well. But there would not be time for this. Best described what happened. Quote, he had hardly finished his last prayer when the door opened and two evil-looking men in civilian clothes came in and said, Prisoner Bonhoeffer, get ready to come with us. Those words, come with us, for all prisoners, they had come to mean only one thing, the scaffold. We bade him goodbye. He drew me aside and said, quote, This is the end, for me, the beginning of life. End quote. On page 531, the camp doctor at Flosenberg gave this account of Bonhoeffer's final moments. H. Fischer Holstrom had no idea to whom he was watching at the time, but years later he gave the following account of Bonhoeffer's last minutes alive. Quote, Through the half-open door in one room of the huts, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer, before taking off his prison garb, kneeling on the floor, praying fervently to his God. I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a short prayer 
then climbed up the steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued after a few seconds. In the almost 50 years that I worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God." End quote. Of course, these recorded events, which capture their conviction and subsequent bravery in the face of certain death, are not an isolated occurrence. Thousands upon thousands of men, women, and children have willingly laid down their lives for Jesus their Lord. The enemy's temporary perceived victory is to the eternal reward of the martyred. I am reminded of the quote of the missionary Jim Elliot, who said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. This simple statement was a paraphrase of a truth that Jesus taught in Mark 8.36. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Jesus stating a hyperbolic statement that if you owned absolutely everything at the expense of your soul, to what did you gain? So we need to ask the question, if we as Christians are soldiers for Christ, to whom are we fighting? Doesn't Jesus instruct us in Luke 6, 27 and 28 to, quote, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you? Well, yes, of course he does. We also find that Jesus instructs us in Matthew 5, 38 and 39. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. We find that in 2 Timothy, we are to be, quote, a good soldier of Christ Jesus. But in Luke 6 and Matthew 5, are we to operate as pacifists? Some might claim that the scriptures are contrary, but that is simply not the case. Our battle is to fiercely contend for the truth. This is why, in a culture of postmodern thinking, we constantly hear people use phrases such as, quote, well, that is your truth, or this is my truth, inferring that truth is subjective to each and every person. However, because the law of God is written on our hearts, see Romans 2, verse 15, we, mankind, intrinsically knows that premise is false. I would like to close with one last clip from the book, The Truth War. MacArthur is referring to the book of Jude, where Jude is calling for believers to contend for the faith. Allow me to highlight verse 4 and verse 22 prior to playing the audio from MacArthur's book. Jude 1, verse 4 and verse 22 says this, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. The convinced. They pose a more difficult problem. You have to snatch them out of the fire, Jude says, suggesting, of course, that they're already in the fire. He pictures apostasy as a burning, destructive, potentially lethal conflagration. The imagery underscores both the urgency of the need for rescue and the magnitude of the evil in the false teaching. The fact that these people are in the fire suggests that they have bought the lie. They have, to some degree, owned the false teaching. They are already being singed by hell. They need something more than mere mercy. This is an urgent rescue operation. And Jude is urging us to use any means, every legitimate means, to pull them from the fire. These circumstances call for aggressive action. Now, the principle here is important. When you meet someone who is a convinced follower of some false doctrine, don't automatically turn your back on that person. Don't instantly push such people away or shun them. Don't respond with hostility. They might be more deceived than deceiving. At the same time, you cannot embrace someone as a part of the true fellowship who rejects essential aspects of gospel truth. You don't offer someone who is convinced of a serious falsehood unconditional acceptance as if they were a believer. But Jude is very specific about how we should respond to such people. Go after them in a very critical rescue operation. Try to snatch them out of the fire. Again, snatching them from the fire means giving them the truth, but with accents of urgency befitting the serious danger such people are facing. 
You come with force. You don't toy with such error or invite the purveyors of it to a dispassionate discussion over tea and biscuits. You treat the situation with an urgency and a sobriety that is commensurate with the evil of apostasy. It is damnable heresy. That is exactly how Jesus responded to the Pharisees. He was strongly confrontive, very blunt. His warnings to them were severe. He spoke to them of judgment, devastation, and hell. His warning was analogous to the kind of warning you would give a neighbor if his house caught fire and you knew he was still inside asleep. In 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, Paul describes spiritual warfare as the demolishing of ideological fortresses. He writes, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The language is deliberately militant. But notice that he's not talking about warfare against people. He's describing a battle against evil ideas, thoughts, arguments, fortresses made of satanic lies, anti-God thought. People are basically victims of the ideas trapped and imprisoned by false doctrines and evil systems of thinking. The point of the warfare is to liberate people from those fortresses. So there is a ministry of mercy to the confused, there is a more urgent and solemn ministry of rescue to the convinced. And then Jude speaks of a third group, the committed. Here Jude employs his strongest and most vivid language. In verse 23 he says, On some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Obviously pulling people from the fires of apostasy requires us to get close to them. Jude suggests there is a severe danger in this. We can't always tell the difference between the merely convinced and the fully committed. Some are deceived. Others are deliberate deceivers. Some are disciples of error. Others are the propagators, the leaders, the false teachers themselves. And Jude suggests that we ought to show even the false teachers themselves a kind of mercy, for sometimes even the deceivers themselves are, to a degree, deceived, and occasionally by God's grace, even they can be pulled from the fire. So show them mercy, Jude says, but do it with fear, despising the defilement of their evil. I want to thank you for listening to this inaugural episode of By His Grace, For His Glory, for the encouragement, prayers, and support that has been given to put this podcast together. In future episodes, we look to explore the battle within the culture, within the church, and within ourselves. This episode was a basic overview of how we are called and commissioned to serve. Please be in prayer, lifting one another up as we fight the good fight. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Until next time, go and serve by His grace and for His glory. Amen.